Hi, I'm Samuel Kamen. Uh, I'm uh, a, uh, a farmer who became a farmer because of a book I read, believe it or not. Um, in uh, 1978, something like that, I was living in Unity, New Hampshire, and I, I was kind of like uh, caretaking a house for somebody who lived in Chicago, and he was coming back for the summer. He's a professor out there. And I asked if I could use a little field of his uh, to grow a garden, because I felt like I wanted to grow a garden. I didn't know anything about growing a garden. I didn't know anything about soil. I didn't know anything about anything. I was uh, an absolute, total, empty city person, like really empty of everything, right? No relationship to anything, just blank. So I went to the Claremont, New Hampshire Library and took out I, they, they, in those days, they had card files, right? Not not computers. So I went to the card file and I took out every book that mentioned food, agriculture, soil, gardening, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I and that winter uh, in Unity, where I was still living, the professor hadn't come yet. I was able to read those books because I had nothing else to do other than put wood on the fire, right? Keep warm. So I read pretty much all of them. Uh, I was very intense at that time and I did it. I read them all. And, but one of them uh, struck me on the head, big time. Woke me, as they say, it woke me up. And that book is, is entitled Soil and Civilization by Edward Hyams. I read that book and then I read it again and then I read it again and I was overwhelmed and astonished and amazed, no exaggeration, that there's, had to, there's a thing called soil and it had to do with human habitation on the planet Earth and the thesis of the book was that all the past civilizations of humankind on the planet, dating back from about 12,000 years ago until today, those, all those civilizations, civilizations had collapsed because of the degradation of the soil and, and the degradation of agriculture. Every single one, and he reviewed seven different civilizations all over the world in detail and showed how the neglect of the soil and agriculture was the reason those civilizations collapsed. At that time, I was of the opinion that civilization was good and they shouldn't collapse. It shouldn't collapse. I thought that then. I have a different opinion now. And if, if you'll give me time, I'll explain that maybe a little later. At any rate, reading this book uh, inspired me at that time to find out more and do it and delve deeply into the soil. And oh, a few years later, after oh, I grew my first garden in Unity, you know, don't forget, when I say first garden, you have to realize that I come from Brooklyn, New York. And at that time in Brooklyn, New York, there were no gardens. There, no, nobody ever said the word soil. And when they said food, I thought it meant what was assembled in the back of the grocery store. I really did. I mean, that's how ignorant I was. I was the ignorant of the ignorant. And so I spent that summer growing my first garden and being amazed that you can put a seed in the soil and it produces food, which is astounding, a miracle, a miracle. And uh, I spent the next uh, several years learning and studying and realizing that um, books can only take me so far. 
that I need face-to-face -face human contact with people who were doing things similarly. And one of those face-to-face -face contacts was with a farmer <coughs> in Langdon, New, New Hampshire. His name is Horace Bascom. He was a dairy farmer with Jersey cows. And somehow, I don't even know how, but I met him and uh, he, was an old, he was older than me then. I was a little younger. Um, and he inspired me to think more deeply and widely about soil and agriculture. And he was my inspiration to go further. That's the beginning of this whole story of basically why I organized the then Natural Organic Farmers Association, NOFA, in 1971. I did it with a very selfish purpose because I wanted to learn more. I wanted to meet people who were doing things, who were experimenting, who were learning themselves. And I thought the best way to take my learning further would be to basically meet people of like mind, right? That's what NOFA was meant to be for me personally. It was very selfish. I wasn't saving the world, right? I, I, you know, people got that wrong. That, that I wasn't there to save the world. I was there to learn, to learn from other people. And it was wonderful and it was great. And we did it. And uh, anyway, the rest is history, right? Yes. Well, uh, what I did in, in June of 1971 was to print up a flyer welcoming people to the founding meeting of NOFA. Of course, NOFA didn't exist. It was all in my mind. But at that time, I sent those flyers to every county extension agent's office in New Hampshire and Vermont. And every feed store in New Hampshire and Vermont, I put them up, I traveled around, passed them out. And on June 6, 1971, on the hillside in Westminster West, not Putney, uh, Westminster West, Vermont, where I was living at the time, on a, on a piece of ground that was a farm at one time that was destroyed by conventional agriculture using atrazine in the cornfield that was corn after corn for 20 years. And I was on that farm and uh, I created on that farm what I thought would be Nature Farms. That was the name of it. And Nature Farms was to be an experimental learning opportunity for myself and everybody else. And it was very nice, many people came and that was the beginning of the actual creation of NOFA. And people came to me and, and start working with me on the land and growing food. And we, we did many, many experimental things. One with, and I'll just as, as an aside, people, a lot of people know this about me, but I'm, I'm enamored, enamored of American white sweet clover. Uh, what is it in, in Latin is Mele Lotus Albus. And Meliodas Albus, I read from some of the books I had, was used by the English people who were followers of Sir Albert Howard and people like that in England about organic agriculture as the basic number one plant that feeds the soil and creates humus. And we planted an acre of Meli Lotus Alba. And I want to tell the story of Meli Lotus Alba. Um, this was, it's a long story, right? So this is only still 1971. We planted an acre of Meli Lotus Alba following the directions of Newman Turner. That he's the one who wrote the book Fertility Farming and uh, Nature Farming in England. And we put down rock phosphate and granite dust but no fertilizer. There's just powdered rock, right? And uh, the first year, it, it actually grew because it doesn't need uh, artificial external nitrogen. It makes its own, 
right, as being a legging. And it grew to about uh, 12 to 18 inches. Beautiful green leaves, very nice plant. And don't forget, I had never seen it grow before. So I'm, I'm looking at it, watching it, observing it, and kind of recording it and all. Very exciting. And then the next year, it's a biennial. And the next year, it died back down to the crown, to the ground. And then the next year, it started growing again. And it, this time, it grew eight feet tall. All right? And the, the, I don't know if you can see, but I'm showing you how big around the stalk was, right? About an inch and a half, and some of them almost two inches. And it was a forest of Melilotus alba, literally a forest. You couldn't walk through it. It was so vigorous and so rich and so strong. And I looked at it and I said, oh my God, this is amazing. And then that fall, with the intention of following Newman Turner's advice, I went to rototill it into the soil, right? Well, I had a tractor driven rototiller with a large engine, you know, and we, I went over it and, and, I, and I went about four feet and it was impossible because it just wrapped around, it was so fibrous, it wrapped around, and it, all it did was make a cylinder of dead Melly Lotus vines and you know plants. Nothing, couldn't do anything. I, I walked away, drove away, I gave up. I said, well, that's that, you know, uh, I'm done. I said, I don't know what else to do. And then I went on to grow carrots and cabbage and you know, all the rest of it. The following spring, after the snow was gone, I went down to look at our acre of Melly Lotus Alba debris, right? What was left over. And it was, the snow had packed it down to the ground and it decomposed and worked in, broke up. And I looked at it and I said, wow, it's almost all gone, almost. And then, mind you, this, this was a farmer, so-called farmer, who had atrazine and poisoned his land for 20, 25 years to grow corn for cows, right? Which is a disaster. And so the soil, when I first went there, was yellow powder, all right? Yellow powder, dust, nothing. No humus, no life, no nothing, right? Two and a half years later, this is a long time. This is not so easy to do that because you got to take a piece of land out of potential production. I went out there that spring and I put my hand into the soil and I went up halfway up to my elbow in black, rich, humus friable earth, full of earthworms and insects and wild creatures and, and it smelled like Hat, like paradise. That's what it smelled like. Anyway, that's when I fell in love with Melly Lotus Alba and realized that with attention to detail and looking at what needs to be done on the land, human beings can find ways to enrich the soil, make it healthy and happy and, and sexy and whatever, and, and, and grow good food without chemicals. And so anyway, that's what happened. It's a wonderful story because it's a true story and it's really what happened. And anybody listening should find some Melly Lotus Alba seed, only the biennial, not the annual, and try and plant it and observe it. Just do a little five by five plot, just to see if I'm not telling the truth, right? Just, just look at it, watch it, watch it grow. And then when you dig it up, look at the nodules on the roots, you'll find thousands of little pink nodules on the roots that are fixing atmospheric nitrogen into the soil. It's pretty exciting. And you don't need a chemical factory to give it the nitrogen, right? You can let nature do it for you. Okay, so um, then how do we develop NOFA? Well, basically, still taking the lead that I had started, which, which was self-education in 19, 
75, I had the opportunity to uh, think widely. Don't forget, I had, I had, ne I was never an organizer. I was never a doer of anything. I mean, all I did was think, right? And this time, I, I said, well, maybe we should have a conference, right? So I went to the what then was the bi-state council of Vermont, New Hampshire, people who are council members of NOFA, and I said to them, I said, you know, we should have a conference. We should bring people together and have classes and courses and workshops and further our educational effort. And this group of people who are all my friends, good people, great people, they all, sit, they all went, no, I don't think so, Sam, no. We have no money, we have no, no, we can't do this, no, forget about it, no. So at that time, I was also on the board of directors of the Biodynamic Farming and Gardening Association, which is an organization that was following Rudolf Steiner's uh, impulses about agriculture. And I went to that board and I said, would you co-sponsor a conference at the high mowing school in Wilton, New Hampshire with NOFA? They never heard of NOFA and I explained to them what NOFA was. And then we'll create a conference, we'll bring people together and expose people to biodynamics is what you wanna do and teach and learn. And they said, yes. So they gave me, I don't know, $500 or something. And they funded it, right? Because NOFA, New Hampshire, Vermont, at that time we had zero dollars, okay? It was all just volunteer people coming and talking. That's all NOFA was, coming and talking, which was okay, you know. Anyway, we had our first conference in 1975. We, the first keynote speaker was Wendell Berry, who happened to be somebody I knew, who I went to visit in, in Kentucky. And uh, people knew about him because of his books. And he, we attracted a lot of attention. And we had 350 people, which is astounding, right? 350 people come from all over including not only Vermont and New Hampshire, but other places too. As a matter of fact, some from Europe. Anyway, uh, we, we had a conference. It was like two and a half days. We had workshops and speeches and talks and, and lectures and demonstrations of everything agricultural and rural, right? And that was the beginning of the actual work that we did, the actual thing we did. Because up until then, we had only just been talking to each other. And uh, oh, we did uh, a bulk buying, some, uh, some rock phosphate, and we did a few, a few things here and there. But basically, this is the first time we all came together. And uh, it, was, it was, seemed to be successful. And then I got a job at the High Moan School as the director of agriculture, because they thought that I was a loudmouth, right? And, and that I could be a teacher. I don't know. I was never a teacher before, but anyway, um, I started working there and developing the farm there. I had my cows and sheep and pigs and, you know, vegetables and all that. And then the next year, I went back to the by state council and I said, let's do it again. And they all laughed again. You know, you know, the, the guy said he stands up to play the piano and everybody laughs, right? Because he doesn't know how to play, play the piano. That was me. I, I didn't know how to make a conference, but I had one year experience. So anyway, we made, we made another conference at High Mowing School. And this time I brought in some speakers from the Biodynamic Association showing chromatography, crystallization, all these magical, wonderful, new scientific, you know, uh, experiences of people learning about agriculture from another perspective, which is the biodynamic one. And then we had about 750 people. You know, we more than doubled. And it was, it was uh, again, pretty successful. Um, I made sure everybody got up early in the morning to go do it. And I rang my cowbell and ran around shaking my cowbell. And so we all got up early and they all attended the classes and the workshops. Then the next year, 
which was 77. This time I said, well, we're going to do this bigger. I like bigger. I come from Brooklyn. Everything big is better, right? And then we, uh, I worked out an arrangement with the, the University of New Hampshire in Durham. And we, I hired some bands to have two different musical venues. We had a coffee shop. We had, you know, all kind of fun things. And we had 150 workshops, right? Uh, from morning till late, in the, late, late in the afternoon, almost till night. And uh, we had 1,500 people show up in, in Durham, New Hampshire. So New Hampshire was pretty much the focus of no for them because I lived in New Hampshire, right? And I was doing it, right? But then other people got uh, excited about it. And then that started moving towards Vermont and New Hampshire more. And it was good, it was good. So anyway, the, the work uh, continued strongly in Vermont with their certification program because we had to tell people, yeah, it really is organic and this is what organic is, right? Most people didn't have a clue. They never even heard the word. And all of a sudden they're, they're seeing the word on food, packaged food, anyway. Even produce at the farmer's markets and all. And so the Vermont, People took a, took a big stride forward and saw working on farmers markets and distribution and things like that, which was very good. By the way, in 1971 and 1972, NOFA, which was then a few people on my farm and nature farms in Westminster, West Vermont, we decided that we're gonna have a relationship with the poorest of the poor in New York City. And we start shipping produce down, all the way down in New York, which was crazy. You know, it was a big footprint and, you know, it was a mistake. But the mistake was on our part, thinking widely and broadly about carbon, carbon footprint. We didn't even know that term then. Um, but the people who received the food really appreciated it and loved it. And we had a great time. And we, we went to uh, daycare centers and to the, ghetto co-ops and stuff like that and it was it was good we did that for a couple of years and the key person in that was john freitag who was not mentioned in the uh in the, in the thing that uh, steve gilman did uh, you must have seen that right um when he interviewed different people about nofa because john freitag was the first full-time driver and trucker he, he, we bought a truck, which leaked a lot of oil, but <laughs> it's another story. Anyway, John took it down and drove down. I drove the first year and John drove the, the next couple of years. Anyway, he was a great guy. He still is a great, great guy, but uh, he, he we did great work. Right? People loved him in New York. But it was like, it was kind of inappropriate to drive so many miles with some produce, even though they needed it. And, and, and the people in... My, in Vermont had bigger, better ideas about farmers markets and local distribution and local storage and local processing. And that took hold, all right? So that's kind of the way it physically started. There were other conferences after that. And, and as I think the conferences were the centerpiece of NOFA. Um, it was where people got together and met each other and learned from each other, which is what my hope was for it. The big, biggest milestone was the certification that Vermont did for Vermont organic farmers. And, and they laid the groundwork for that. And then, of course, then it became no for wide and all. But uh, that was a big milestone because up until then, our relationship with the eater of our foods was just that they liked it, you know. But now they had a, a mental a liking, right, about why, right, and what is organic and how do we prove it and show it and all that. So anyway, that was a milestone. Um, I think the other milestone was the fact that the conferences start getting more and more people from all over and, and many from Massachusetts. And uh, there are two people, as you probably know, who came, who were in uh, 
Williamsburg, I think is the name of the town. I forget the name of the town. Anyway, uh, Julie Ralston and I, I can't think of his name. Um, anyway, I, my, I'm, losing, I'm losing my short term memory. It just happens. I'm, I'm 85 years old, so I'm, I'm forgiven, right? Okay. Um, anyway, the, the conferences start getting bigger and better and more broad, right? And then we took on Massachusetts and then Connecticut and then Rhode Island and then New Jersey and Pennsylvania, you know, like it, be, it really became the Northeast Organic Farmers Association rather than just only natural. And because anyway, natural, the word became corrupted because every cockamamie company in the world used natural and didn't mean anything. But everybody knew where the Northeast was, which is where we were. And so that was another big milestone. The, uh, the bringing, the coming together of all the other states and making chapters in New York State with Steve Gilman and, and uh, Bill Dusing in Connecticut and all these wonderful people uh, start expanding on the idea and making NOFA bigger and better than that. Uh, I think when Helen Caldecott was at, was one of our co-speakers, and you know, uh, and she, and I was with her on the stage, and and I, I I got up and said people people didn't expect this, and I got up and said, NOFA is a failure, and everybody got oh what's he talking about? Oh. I said well we failed because we didn't create an organization that had 200 million members. That's why we failed, because that's what we really should have as the goal, at least 200 million, right? And in other words, my, my whole vision of NOFA was not that we should only talk to each other and close, but that we should spread over the whole country and the whole country should become organic and everybody should learn about the earth and care for the earth and and who we are on the earth and what this is all about. Anyway, so after I made my dramatic statement that NOFA failed, Helen Caldecott got up and she's the one who talked about, well, you know who she is, right? Probably. She uh, was very outspoken about nuclear, anti-nuclear and nuclear waste and stuff like that. She's a doctor, she's very smart. Anyway, so she got up and, and she said, oh, Samuel, he says, you're wrong. She said, because NOFA has not failed because uh, if, if, we, if we became just amorphized into everything, I don't know if that's the right word, but if we just became part of all of America, then how would we come together and dance and laugh and have fun and enjoy each other's company on a small face-to-face -face level? And so she corrected me, which was okay. And I accepted that correction. Uh, but that was a, a monumental thing for me to think about. I was a little bit too intense about wanting the whole country to be organic and, and should have realized that it's a slow, long process. And little by little, we do it together. And here we are 50 years later, there's quite a few organic growers, but maybe not enough, but that's all, all right. The most important thing that we've done, right, is to uh, basically bring the word organic into common usage so that, that even the people in the Department of Agriculture in the various states understood it and agreed with it and everything was transformed the universities accepted organic and now organic is part of the university's programs and you know all of that which is wonderful and great yeah we we brought the word organic and the concept of caring for the earth to the minds of many many people but now for the next 50 years we have to have that taught in every elementary school in the country, that children have to learn their food, 
doesn't come from being assembled in the back of the grocery store. No, it's grown in soil. And how has that happened? And um, that the soil is alive. And each grade of child in elementary school and high school should be taught and shown and demonstrated the excitement of life in the earth, right? And, you know, we have instruments today that can, uh, these electron microscopes that can look at the creatures in the soil and, and explode them up big. And they're amazing. They're incredible. I have a book called Tales from the Underground. And it's all about the creatures in the earth under the soil. And children would be astounded. They would go crazy to see these pictures of these kind of weird looking odd creatures like, like water bears. Have you ever seen a water bear? It's like amazing, right? See a picture of a water bear and others like there's millions, millions of creatures living in the soil, millions. You know, in, in a little teaspoon, you could have a billion different creatures in a teaspoon of soil, a billion. They're all microscopic because you can't see them unless you had very, very expensive instruments. But the reality is that we're walking on, a, on a, an environment that's teeming with life so long as you're not walking on American farmland. Because American farmland, where they're growing corn and soybeans to fatten sick cows, right? And dying chickens, that, that farmland is dead. That's just yellow powder. There's no growth and no life there. It's an aside, right? I didn't mean to be negative, but you know, when you're walking there, you're not walking over this wonderful field of life, right? Anyway. So I think that that's what we could do. We could commit ourselves to having soil and agriculture and food and life taught in every elementary and high school in the country. That's a goal I feel no fish should commit itself to, in addition to growing food and making a living. Okay, that's, that's a really good question because I'm, I think about that every day, all day for the past five years. It, because I've had made a study of collapse of civilizations. As you know, it started in 1971, or actually 69 when I went to the library. And we humans um, are somewhat aware of the fact that we're on the verge of collapse the whole society, the whole civilization. It's a terrible thing to say, and I, nobody wants to hear that. And I don't even want to say it. But the reality is that we're moving in that direction. As you, as you probably read about the UPPC, the United Nations Panel on Climate Change, right? Said that we're now on a trajectory for the end. For the end, it's it's where even if we stop using fossil fuels today, a hundred percent, we're still going to experience pretty drastic results of what we've done already to the climate. Because climate disruption, which is no longer global warming or climate change, it's now climate disruption, as we can see clearly with our eyes. If we only have to open our eyes, we can see that there are floods and fires all over the world, tornadoes, everything, just storms. It's, it's a mess, okay? So the advice for new young farmers is recognize that you are the future, that the future will be sustained by a world made by hand. It's gonna be a handmade world. The use of fossil fuels will disappear within the next 50 years. So it will just go away, period, done. Which means no motors, no engines, no magic machines to do anything, even to create fake fertility in so-called fertilizers. So what we're going to do is find ourselves living in a world made by hand. By the way, that's a title of a really good book, The World Made by Hand. And so I'm saying to these farmers, 
Look in the mirror and see who you are. Don't just think that, oh, I want to grow food. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be wonderful. Understand that you are the tip of the spear of survival and recreation of human society in a world made by hand. And we have to be fed. And how do you feed the world made by hand? By many, 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 many more. Am I repeating myself? Many, 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 even more than that. People coming and living on the land and growing food. We have 2% of the population on the land now, so-called growing food, which is not true. They're just growing corn and soybeans of fat and sick animals. I'm sorry to be so negative, but that's a reality. You couldn't have a little reality in this thing, right? It's okay? All right. So what we need is a, a thousand times more than that of people living on the land and growing food with their hands, a world made by hand. And they have to see that. They have to look in the mirror and understand, oh, I'm part of a vast movement all over the world of people, young people mostly, who want to grow food with their hands on the land to feed our fellow human beings. That's what I see for the future. And what young farmers should be thinking and looking. Look in the mirror and see who you are. I, 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 I live in Maine right now, but I don't only think of Maine. And I don't think of just New England. I think of the world. My mind thinks of the world. But the people in New Hampshire have a hard row to hoe, okay? Because the soils here are poor, mostly, weak, acidic, and difficult. There are many stony soil. The, the, the reason I call my farm Stonyfield Farm back in 19, whatever, way back, right, before NOFA. Um, anyway, it's because there's fields in New Hampshire full of stones. So when I think about New Hampshire, we think about a, a very difficult place. The granite under, under us, right, brings a physical hardness to our life and our ability to grow food. That's not to say it can't be done. It's just difficult and hard. And we have to recognize and accept the fact that we have to learn how to deal with this soil and this hard life here in New Hampshire. Short growing season, weather in unpredictable, disruptive climate change and all of that. So I would say to the people of New Hampshire, what we need to do is learn from each other and learn who's doing what and what's successful. Learn what's successful on this hard, difficult land, the soil. Don't forget, you know, New Hampshire was one of the first states to be uh, basically depopulated of, of farmers and they went to the factories. Why? Because the factory at least offered to secure funds to maybe put enough food on the table. And the farmers were not doing so well. And that's why the farms were left abandoned. And that's why you could walk almost anywhere in New Hampshire and find stone walls that the farmers put there, right? To get the stones out of the fields so they can farm it. And now they're all covered with forests, right? And that's the reality. That's the result of industrialization and, and, the, and the industrial society making sure that they pay just enough minimum wage to get the people off the farm and come to the cities into Manchester and Nashua and wherever else to earn enough to put food on the table. Not to have a great life. Those, many of those workers who came off the farms in New Hampshire because it was so difficult, it was difficult. They, they didn't have a great life. They had a very difficult life, hard life. And uh, anyway, that's what I think. I, I think that for New Hampshire, people have to learn 
how to deal with what they got, which is what they have is acidic granite based difficult soil and except for maybe the Connecticut Valley and they should stop growing corn there and they should start growing other things. And I won't tell them what to do because I don't know everything. I think that um, NOFA is a, is a great concept that we have to hold and use. It's a great concept, it's a great idea, right? And the idea is that people can come together and learn from each other, teach each other and grow together. Um, and I think I wanna emphasize that. Um, I don't wanna belittle the fact that there is such a thing as human organization and, and sometimes human organization can work. Not like the United States of America, that's not working. That's my opinion, uh, unfortunately. But I think uh, local people getting together in certain valleys, certain regions, certain watersheds, get together and teach each other and learn from each other how to care for the earth and how to grow food into the future by hand. <laughs>